right, well, welcome students, families, people joining online, guests of the seniors, to our third day of senior project presentations. We, uh, first of all, a big congratulations to Sandine and Sandra and Tammy and Naya for wonderful presentations yesterday. The conviction with which you spoke, the clarity of thought and the courage that you all displayed was really inspiring, so thank you. Before we move on to today, please make sure your phones are off. For those of you new to the building, the bathrooms are around this corner and about halfway down the hallway. And um, today we're gonna have three presentations, two before lunch and one in the afternoon. And I will turn it over to Senor Aguero to introduce our first presenter. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone. So I've had the opportunity to know Ray for almost three years. In June of last year, Ray asked me if I could be his senior project advisor. Of course, I said yes, even though I didn't know what his project was going to be about. <laughs> but it, just the idea of being able to learn about a new topic, along with a student, made me very excited. We started meeting, and then every meeting that we thought that it was going to take 30 minutes, it turned out to be 90 minutes or even more. And <laughs> it was um, these long conversations that we started to have, and they were fascinating to me. I actually learned quite a lot from you, Ray. There is something powerful when a person has a strong interest or a passion, right? And this person is ready to share their ideas and um, their knowledge that they have already. And I listened and listened. And then we started exploring the different ideas that Ray had. In one of our long conversations, Ray shared that he was designing a board game. And it was after that talk that his senior project became about product design. One thing I knew about Ray from before I became his senior project advisor was that his artistic abilities were phenomenal. And as his Spanish teacher for two years, I learned that Ray is a person who is a very good at drawing He's very good at drawing, he's very creative, and he's very detail-oriented. So as his project started to unfold, I could see his extraordinary skills of design and meticulousness in each part of it. But one of the things that I most enjoyed getting to know about Ray in this journey that I didn't know before was his great sense of humor. This project that you are about to hear is the combination of many components, but the three that I would like to highlight today are creativity, dedication, and the great, great sense of humor. So please welcome Rehan Hasenbegovic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Rehan, and my senior project, as you can see by the title, is about board games. Board games are often associated with an older crowd who likes to play Dungeons and Dragons, type of never-ending games, or really young kids who like to play Monopoly, Cat in the Hat, and such. Last year, somewhere around this time, I woke up one morning and had an inspiration create a board game. The idea for the concept was somewhat common with a bit of a twist to it. Basically, the story took place in an apocalyptic world where the character would be faced with obstacles and challenges as the protagonist is on a search for his missing family. I also thought it would be neat to choose a place that might be uncommon for such stereotypical premise. Most apocalyptic games take place in the Western world which is not a surprise, 
and I chose India. The board game I have been designing since the beginning of last summer has been a lot of fun, and most of my time has been devoted to developing the storyline, characters, and the mechanics of the actual playing process. <clears throat> As I have somewhat good artistic skills, I initially thought the graphic part will take much shorter time than the game testing. Yet, I found out both took an enormous time. As I went through this grueling process, I realized why, in professional studios, there are such large teams when working on these projects. Personally, I have always had an immense fascination with India, and choosing this as the place for my storyline was such an exciting adventure for me. I made sure that all my in-game characters, environments, and artifacts were indeed inspired by actual Indian culture, but with strong sense for what is not appropriate to use in order not to offend their culture. As you can see here, good studios make sure their products are culturally sensitive. Respectable game design studios strive to create games that are for everyone. To help them in those efforts, they're always hiring freelancers who serve as cultural reviewers. Main themes in the board game I've designed as a part of my project are the dangers of AI technology, genetic modification, war, environmental issues, divisions among people across ethnic, socioeconomical, and individual beliefs, moral questions, respect for nature, and how to balance these pressing questions with kind and good nurtured humor. Board games were traditionally designed to not just offer an escape into alternative universes of possible scenarios, but also as a problem-solving exercise for the mind. In the initial board games, in our modern times, adults who craved mental challenge in a form of a puzzle were the ones who were the first to add an element of fantasy of storytelling into a mathematical and deductive set of rules upon which the board games exist. These designers would take everyday issues, challenges, and problems, and wrap them around the narrative, which is fantastic and easily accessible to a young mind to approach, play, and learn through a medium, which is represented as simply as it is just a game. Combining fantastic settings from imagination with real life-like situations and problems has resulted in mini game books and board games. A really large portion of all of these board games, once the surface of the story is removed, reveal a learning path to solving a number of logical problems. All the logical problems that the player is presented with are mirrored in our actual reality. The simple setup of where do I go from here, or what do I take or leave, or how do I profit from a current bad or good situation, combined with the randomness, offers to the player a way to creatively engage and assess an unexpected situation and find the best solutions to a problem. The randomness we encounter in the board games, or games in general, is a big part of the unexpected element in the real world itself we experience daily. In a creative way, board games and game books are a way to dress up everyday problems. These types of settings can have insight exciting environments for intrigued minds, where they can tackle challenges without being overwhelmed with the nature of the problem itself. Since the problem is presented in an alternative reality, the alternative reality, besides being fantastical in nature, can also be a medium where joyful humor can spontaneously arise in an easier manner and can be at times more interesting than the everyday settings. This provides not only the joyful hours spent in logical deduction and brainstorming solutions of the challenge itself, but a learning and satisfactory aha moments whenever the peak of solution is reached. This type of involvement in playing provides an ultimate satisfaction where not only the game is played well, but that the choices taken within the rules of the game were well chosen. The satisfying discovery of solving the puzzle figuring out the mechanics of the game, understanding of the issues and problems presented, and finding the path to get to the best results from seemingly a vast amount of complicated problems entices us to keep playing. Analytical thinking through playful actions is the key. 
the concentration of the player who is attempting within a realistic scenario to come up with the most logical moves and creative ideas about solving problems can sharpen someone's thinking. It can also reinforce thinking as a team, since many of these games are either made to pitch players against one another or to work together to solve the tasks in front of them. The in-game challenges can broaden ideas when troubleshooting or understanding the obstacles, which in itself is a satisfying and fun group interaction. This type of interaction can lead to inspiring amount of individual ideas and solutions, which reinforces a skill set of communication within the group. Agreeing and adopting strategies, or even just having a thinking session dedicated to a challenge that needs solving, can easily bond the ideas of different players, which are oriented towards the same goal. At the same time, the joy of playing in a group environment is an additional bond between thinkers who freely express the possible solutions and offer their narratives. The board game I've designed is for single player, and I often get the question, could I add the possibility of multiplayer? I initially did not really thought much about it, as I had solely concentrated on the storyline of the game and different possible quests that could be embedded within. <clears throat> Perhaps in times like the 80s and 90s, single-player board games did not really show up on the market. With time, the designs of the games have become more complex, and the current single-player board games have an edge of complexity that is appealing to people who like to play board games. When I was first time prompted by this question, my immediate response was that younger generations, mine included, had become by far more engaged in video game playing than generations prior. Video games, as alluring and fun as they can be, are problematic because they are often too violent for no reason, and the sheer nature of endless sitting in front of the screen is a problem in and itself. Another thing I would add is that young teenagers might often face the challenge of not having friends living close by, or they might not have siblings to play a board game with. So in those cases, playing a card game or board game is, in my opinion, a far better option than computer games. One thing to consider is that most video games created today are designed to be looping without an end in sight, and therefore cannot be as exciting as a carefully crafted story with puzzles and beautiful illustrations. This is not to say that the video games visually are not appealing. Some of them have stunning visuals, but still there's something about playing a game that has physical elements, such as a deck of cards and the roll of the dice. Currently, the market for single-player board games is really popular and has been steadily rising since 2016. Publishing, or shipping the game, has been my big challenge when creating this product, as well as making the final prototype, streamlining, troubleshooting, and finding the final setup for printing in larger quantities, I have discovered to be quite time-consuming. Options for printing in larger quantities, which obviously reduces the cost significantly and actually makes the product profitable, are many. But the quality I was looking for was not always as expected. Designers usually pitch their design to big publishing firms, who either have an in-house team who take care of the production, printing, and distribution, and a separate team of people who handle the advertisement. I initially believed that with due diligence, I could successfully market my board game if I dedicated enough time to it, given the endless possibilities of internet-based platforms. <coughs> Sorry. I initially believed that with due diligence, I could market my board game if I dedicate enough time to it. Now that I've gone through the larger part of the process, I am trying to keep my expectations at a moderate level, as I've figured out that a lot of great games are produced by individuals, yet they get buried with the amount of stuff larger than companies create. Some of the most important steps I found out to really pay attention to were making sure that the concept design is as unique as possible, making a first good impression on the audience, meaning the quality of the product 
print, color saturation, etc., as well as making a priority of a writing rule book of excellent quality and exactness. When I was in eighth grade, a really popular board game came out, which was highly anticipated and had a great following. The cost was $50, which was pretty steep for a board game. The game itself had an elaborate setup and numerous moving parts with great designs. Yet, the rules were poorly explained and implemented, and the flow of the game was rather slow and senseless at times. The publishers, instead of releasing a better playtext, they have marketed an expensive addition to the game for another $40 as an attempt to disguise the flawed design. This was really disappointing, and all the people who bought the game were quite upset. In order to learn how to make the product visible, I have spent hours on sites such as Board Game Geek in order to find out the best strategy of how to gain visibility. One of the methods which I will implement is to send samples to content creators and well-known reviewers in hopes that they would publish a review on their websites. <clears throat> if I was to achieve a moderate success, or even if it does fail, I am motivated enough to create another concept and then try to pitch it via submission process to an actual publishing studio. This might generate more sales, but in my current case, as I'm a novice and without financial backing, self-publishing is the way to go. One good thing about the self-published process is that the designer has all the freedom and creative control over the product, which at times can await the challenge of details and initial financial investment. One good thing I've discovered is that there is a possibility where one could print on demand, which is more reasonable and sustainable. Also, uh, I don't want to end up having stacks of boxes in my house. <laughs> Another option I've been exploring is Kickstart crowdfunding, where I could show footage of the game concept and pictures of the prototype. In this way, customers could prepay, and if a certain number is reached, the cost of printing could be significantly reduced. Other core points that I want to emphasize and consider is the green aspect of the production. I do not want any components to be plastic and would love to find a printer that uses environmentally friendly ink. As I went further through my process of completing the game, I have realized that handling the artwork versus the printing and distribution is like living on two different planets. I enjoy both, and I feel I have learned an enormous amount of valuable information in comparison when I just started thinking about doing it. Yet, in all honesty, handling the design and artwork is what I enjoy the most. In the future, I'll be really interested to work with someone who would enjoy the publishing aspect of this <clears throat> aspect, and perhaps with joint forces, establish a game production studio. This sounds rather like a big goal, but all big studios started somewhere. <clears throat> it is believed that the first board game we have a record of was called Senate. It was used around 3,300 to 2,700 BC in Egypt during the first dynasty of rulers. The game itself was depicted in frescoes and tombs, and this is how we know about it. It resembles something similar to a chessboard game where parts were made out of stone tablets and bright, bright glass chips were used as moving parts. When thinking about the chess as a game, one striking thing is that we tend to look at the really best players as pure logical geniuses. Yet, majority of them have never received a form of higher training in math and logic. This goes to show that engaging in board game-like activities has a strong ability to sharpen one's mind. In the 19th century, people have become more intrigued by the lure of puzzles and challenging each other to a good riddle. This has steadily taken a new direction, where we see the attempts to make beautifully designed games for young children. One famous example is Mando Get Mad, a board game designed by Frederick Schmidt, who created it for his own children in 1905. Besides Monopoly, this was my favorite game to play when I was little, as it was super fun and exciting to play. Board games are just one example of this type of entertainment. Jigsaw puzzles would be a similar example, but of more simplistic mechanism. Monopoly, Scrabble, and Checkers are some of the most popular board games in North America. 
These are well known, and their appeal is in the quickness of the flow of the game, which is adrenaline inducing. The game I've designed takes two to three hours maximum to complete. I was worried in some instances, the storyline and the amount of quests might become daunting, but I've made a giant effort to make sure the progression is quick with plenty of outbursts and laugh out loud moments. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just, um, I just want to thank everyone for coming here today. Uh, I just want to thank my friends and fam for coming here, and uh, most importantly. I just want to thank my senior project advisor, uh, Ms. Aguero, for being there for every step of the way. Thank you. Great job, Ray. Great job. Okay, questions. All right, let's see. I have two. Um, first of all, great job, Ray. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, my first question is, um, I was wondering if you could talk about the artwork and how you made it and mm -hmm. what that process was like. Yeah, sure. So the application that I used to make this artwork was a pistol. And at first, when I first started designing the game, I was a bit unsure at first. But then I, I think as I just went along, I sort of just made my own art style. And I feel like that really fitted well with the design of the game. So I felt really proud of, about that. And uh, it would usually take like hours a day just to, like make a single piece of good art. So it's really time consuming, but it's satisfying at the end. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, my second question is what's your favorite board game now? <laughs> Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that would be, I think that would be Katen. So it's basically like a sort of like a strategy game. It's like a it's basically a multiplayer game where you basically sort of just like scavenge for like resources. Yeah. 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 Jamie. Uh, great job, by the way. I'm curious, what are the actual like? How do you play the game? Okay, so there's um. I'm still working on like some of the rules of the game though. So it's not all the artwork is done, but like the rules will take like a couple of months to make. But to give you a simple rundown, essentially what it is is basically there's like this uh, bit of a long tile map and essentially you have to travel uh, basically across every tile to get to the end to like fight this final boss. So that that's just the basic rundown of it though. So. Yeah. Were there any unexpected challenges that came up that were hard to deal with, and how did you overcome those? Ah, that's that's a good question. Well, let's see. Hmm. Well, give me a sec. I think the difficult part was just like trying to figure out how to like have everything fit well together, because eventually, like, I had all these different cards, and I also had to make sure like the flow of the game was smooth. And for me personally, it was a really difficult challenge to try to like polish the game. So it, it took many months, so yeah. Okay, here. Yeah. yeah. Great job. Thanks. And I just, <laughs> I just, I have two questions. Yeah, so sure. the first one is, what was the game you were talking about that like went up in price because the rules were bad and the name? Okay, so <laughs> I, I didn't want to bash I didn't want to bash that board game because I didn't want to mention the name, but it, okay, it was basically Fallout, the, the board game. Mm. And uh, I, I played it multiple times, and let me tell you, that not even, my, not even my dad understood it. We were just like, we watched like two YouTube tutorials, even the guy in the tutorials didn't know how to play it. So then we're like, <laughs> oh wait, we can't even refund it. <laughs> so yeah. And 
did you take any inspiration from specific board games from designing yours? Um, I, I mean, I sort of just like made it up as I went along, but yeah, because usually I like to make my own original ideas. Yeah. So when you were talking about the cultural sensitivity part of it, mm -hmm. um, have you found someone to help you with that already? Like, have you looked at that and have you found any surprises mm -hmm. in that as far as India goes? And then lastly, um, you said you just woke up one morning and you had this idea for a board game and that's so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So did you really just wake up one morning and it was there like that? Y yeah, it was. Was I it mean, a dream? No, I just, I literally <laughs> just woke up one morning and I was like, why not make something? Okay. So good. yeah. Sensitivity part, I was oh, oh, yeah. the, oh, sorry, you asked yeah, two questions. So questions. Yeah. That, so I'm still, you know, doing my fair share of research, uh, got to, you know, make sure that I, I fairly represent the people in that board game. So, you know, nothing's like stereotypical or anything. So it's always good to do your research first before you make a board game. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, so first of all, I was really excited when I saw your uh, poster I, because I'm Indian. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I, I kind of had two questions. Oh yeah, and you can ask me about any cultural sensitivity things. I can yeah. be a consultant. Uh, that I also kind of had two questions. So the first one was, what are some of the locations that you uh, used for your board games in India? And second, uh, how many board games do you own? I'm guessing it's a lot. Um, I own around like 10 board games. And for the location part, um, I basically just like, Basically, it's going to take place in like northern India. That's what I was thinking. And I'm still sort of like finding the, like still doing my research on that. So I just want to take my time with it and I don't want to like rush the process. So yeah. Okay. Here we have one more. Uh, how long did the whole thing take you? Oh, like to make all the art? <laughs> that, took a, that took a whole year. Yeah. It's quite time to. Yeah. Hi, hi Ray. Uh, hi. Fantastic presentation. I really loved it, so I want to make sure I said that first. Um, and I've appreciated seeing your board game so many times, you know, talking one on one. Um, you talked a lot, and I think you represented well how beneficial board games are, like to your mind and to your logic. Mm -hmm. And I was curious what your thoughts were on the social aspect. So when you're playing multiplayer games or cooperative games with other people, how does that aspect of board gaming uh, affect you, and how do you think it should it can affect other people? Oh, wait, could you just repeat that last part? Sorry, I yeah, didn't hear. How do you believe the social aspect of board gaming is beneficial? Or beneficial? Well, for example, like I feel like some board games can really teach you some like uh, basic skills like math, uh, communication skills, and I feel like that's really important, especially nowadays. So yeah. Thank you. Rudy. <laughs> Fabulous job, Ray. I thank love you, it. thank you. Um, you know, it was really exciting, mm -hmm. like uh, hearing you tell me all about your process as you were going through the process. And yeah. I, I got to know, Ray. Yeah. When am I able to play this board game? So, okay, I'm glad you asked. So, eventually, once I I graduate, uh, I plan on just like polishing it up a little bit more. I also just want to expand upon the storyline of the game so it's you know nice and deep and rich and all the different characters. And then eventually I will sort of just like find a publisher who could like help me publish the game. So maybe in like maybe in like a half a year or so maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As, as someone who also wakes up with random ideas, I usually ra last about like 2 weeks. Huh. How did you keep this going for a, a year? How did you? Oh, like how do I keep up my, my yeah. repetition? So basically like, you know, like every morning I would have like an, an unhealthy amount of coffee, like two to three cups, <laughs> and I would just like keep going at it, you know? And uh, you know, e even like when my back hurts or like when I just overwork, I just like keep going at it. So um, basically like always just stay motivated and like no matter what, no matter the challenge. 
Yeah. Uh, Ray, I was just gonna ask. I really like your concept, but do you ever think of making the game into like a video game instead of just a board game? <laughs> Maybe. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, Ray. That was. Fantastic. Really um, enjoyed hearing you articulate all these wonderful things. I, I'm a fan of board games as well yeah. and, um, and have several at home. And I'm curious, you know, th what I found with different board games, some feature more cooperation than competition. And, and uh, you, know, or, you know, there's like a little bit of both and some you can really kind of play and have a wonderful time just being non-competitive entirely and just still enjoy yourself. And others, you really have to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious what you've uh, incorporated, you know, how you're, what's your concept of this game? Is, is there, is it both? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so basically my board game has a, well, there is combat in it, but it's mostly just more story oriented. So that's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, why did you decide to use pixel art for your game? Because it, I mean, it looks beautiful. I'm just curious uh, what the decision. You know, I think when I was just like little, I grew up with a lot of pixelated games like the Super Mario Bros, uh, Pac-Man. So I was really just like a fan of that old school 2D art style. So that's where my inspiration came from for that. This will be our last question for, for Ray, Kate, and... Hi, um, my question is, like, one from one to ten, how strategic do you think this game is? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear. One to ten, how strategic do you think this game is? Um, I would just give it like a seven out of ten. Like, strategic-wise. Thank you, Ray. That was fantastic. Thank you for being a great audience. Thank you for the ones that are uh, watching from home or from somewhere else. So our next presentation will be at 11 a.m. So you now for um, high school, you have a break. And we'll see you here to start promptly at 11. Thank you all.
what happened? Bracelets. Oh, thank you. So do they have a, like a, a, a story or no? Uh, not so much. Not so much? <laughs> I used to be like this with bracelets. Uh -huh. And then I start to, to change. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, welcome back. We're <laughs> We're ready to start with our second presentation of the day of day number 3. So, just a quick reminder for you for those of you that have a cell phone or any device, please turn it off. And um and welcome for the ones that are streaming to see this presentation from somewhere else. And without further ado, please welcome Mr. Paulson. Hi, everyone. Humans tell stories. That is a foundational part of being a human being. And that requires two things, especially. Language and imagination. The thing about imagination is that it is a mess. Largely because it does not need to obey time. Language can only take place with adhering to the passage of time. So for somebody whose imagination, like Jamie's, runs only on one speed, fast forward, <laughs> shaping a massive imagination into something that abides by the time we all live in is an extraordinary task. I cannot overstate how much work it is to take raw imagination, daydreams, fantasy, inspirations and influences from every which way and shape that into a new world that abides by its own rules, has structure and has stories of its own. That is a huge task. And that is the task that Jamie decided to take on for their senior project. I remember very little to nothing about what Jamie's original intention for their senior project was in the spring of last year. I do remember one quote, which I'll share with you from the survey, the, the questionnaire that they filled out about their intentions for their senior project, and that was, which maybe had something to do with a graphic novel at that point, but the part I remember was, I just want to get down some of the stories rattling around in my head. And in the way they phrased that, I think was a really um, 
apt bit of self-reflection on the need to tell the stories in your head when it comes to somebody whose imagination runs on fast forward. So what you are going to be presented with today is a bit of the tip of the iceberg of the bottom of the iceberg of what it is to create a fantasy world. I am so proud of the work that Jamie has done, the extraordinary amount of work over a lot of time through a lot of twists and turns, but always with a dogged determination to get to a version of a new world that they can share with you all. And I look forward to see how it evolves from here. Without further ado, Jamie Greenwald. <coughs> Wait a second. Oh, it's already on. Okay. So, a lot of people have the misconception that authors write these amazing tales right from the get-go, that their first drafts are perfect. And it's not the most absurd thing ever to think, especially if you have no experience actually writing a story, and when all you see is that final published draft. I myself used to be one of those people, naive, old me, but the truth is writing a story is extremely, extremely messy. People write because they have so many ideas in their head and inspiration swimming in their minds and they, until just something happens that they just have this idea that they need to expand on, that is an evolution of the ideas that they already had. And it's, it's like a supernova almost, a big bang. Um, ideas are never stagnant in storytelling. They are always evolving. Uh, and it can take years just to come up with a cohesive plot. For example, J.R.R. Tolkien, author of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, worked on the world for over 10 years before he actually wrote The Hobbit. Writing is something that takes time and error, and that's what the point of drafts are. Drafts are not supposed to be good. They're just supposed to get the ideas out onto paper. The perfect idea that you might have in your head about your story will never come out perfectly the first time, and that is fine, because drafts are for creating the next best thing and moving towards the best version of your story that you can make. So. Every single story, while taking so many inspirations along the journey of its creation, tends to start with one small spark. For many authors, that spark was their own kids. Take Rick Riordan. Riordan's son, Haley, um, asked him to tell bedtime stories about the Greek gods and heroes, and Riordan was happy to oblige. Uh, Riordan had taught Greek mythology for years. Uh, Haley told him to make one up. Riordan remembered a creative pro writing project that he used to do with his sixth graders. He would let them create their own demigod hero, the son or daughter of any god they wanted, and have them describe a Greek-style quest for that hero, and thus, Percy Jackson and his adventure across the United States was born, and then it got really popular and spiraled into four book series with two spin-offs. Then there's The Hobbit. Um, Tolkien was grading papers one afternoon when he stumbled across a blank piece of paper, and for no reason, he just wrote, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. He didn't know why he wrote it, but he became fascinated by it. And by the time he started formally writing The Hobbit, well, I already said this, he, already w he was writing for <laughs> 10 years on the world and stories behind it to make it feel cohesive, and those stories were published as The Silmarillion. And similarly to Riordan, J.R.R. Tolkien told the story of The Hobbit in the form of improvised bedtime stories for his own kid. Expanding on The Hobbit, in its current iteration, it tells the story of a timid everyman going on a quest to eventually slay a dragon, or at least try to. In the published version of the story, Smog dies not by the protagonist, but instead by a brave man named Bard. He was the captain of Lake Town's archers and stays in town to fend off Smog while everyone else evacuates. A bird lands on his shoulder and tells him to look for a weak spot, and he hits the weak spot head-on with his bow, and 
and kill Smog. But originally, Bilbo would have killed Smog, and the scene would have been uncharacteristically epic, involving Bilbo surfing down a river of blood inside a golden cup after cutting Smog's belly open. I believe that this was a change made to highlight that anyone can have the bravery to stand up to really big, daunting threats. Um, another thing that was changed was that Bilbo was originally going to be very charming and charismatic, well-beloved in his community, but he, but he was changed to be much more anxious and timid because it makes him more relatable and sends the message that if he has the courage to go on a quest to face against a dragon, that means you can too. He might not have been the one to actually slay the dragon, but he still had the courage to face the perils of adventure head on. And that one last change that was made was Go with Gollum's personality. Uh, Gollum would have been much friendlier originally, and while he still would have asked Bilbo riddles for the ring, they would have parted on friendlier terms. The final version makes Gollum more of an obstacle to be overcome, and Bilbo had to trick Gollum in order to get the ring from him. Uh, it sh this change shows that the average person is a lot craftier than they might seem, and that is what the theme a lot of the themes of The Hobbit are, I feel like. Lastly is Harry Potter, which is controversial, but it still is interesting to talk about, because it, according to J.K. Rowling, it took 17 drafts to get the chapter of the first, or the draft of the first chapter right. Uh, the final version of the chapter that we all know involves Uncle Vernon um, as he tries to go about his m life normally on a day that isn't so normal. Um, then perspective jumps to Professor McGonagall and Dumbledore when they come along to set baby Harry in front of the door of the Dursleys. Um, the way the first chapter is framed makes Harry's survival feel very weird, like very fascinating. There's so many wizards going around just sort of not hiding, just being like, wow, he who shall not be named is dead. This is amazing. This is wonderful. But there isn't really talk of Harry at all. And we only know, hear about Harry's survival from McGonagall and Dumbledore. And it, there's a lot of mystery surrounding it, which makes things very interesting. It asks the question of what happened? How did he survive? But it also makes it so that, but it also puts the emphasis more on um, his sort of getting out of the Dursleys. Sorry. Um, but the original version of the draft, of the, of the first version, was had the focus be a lot more on action. Um, the first draft had a muggle man notice an explosion out at sea. He arrives on, on an island, am and among charred ruins and beside burnt bodies, the man finds Harry unharmed. The first draft has the focus on the action. Since the reader would more or less know what happened, they wouldn't care as much. With the final version, we don't know the full context. We know his parents died, and we know whoever killed Harry's parents couldn't kill Harry. The question of why did he survive is so much more compelling when you don't really know what happened, which is probably why it took so many drafts for J.K. Rowling to get it right. She needed to find that balance of drama and mystery. One sec. Now I'm going to talk about the story that I've been working on for the past few years and a little bit about how I arrived at the major plot elements of the story. And keep in mind that a lot of what I'm talking about is just the background, not the actual story itself. <laughs> but anyways, so first off, we have the main protagonist, Marlo, who wakes up in a city littered with shattered glass. A man named Thoth wakes her up with a vision, telling her hurriedly to seek out a man named Seba. Seba and Thoth are both what are called hunters, an elite group of warriors formed over 100 years ago to stop wars before they happened. However, during an event known as the Last War, one of the, hun excuse me, one of the hunters defected and placed a curse on each of the hunters, where a fury, an evil, monstrous version of the hunter they awoke from, made only to destroy, would awaken whenever a hunter had a moment of clarity, revelation, and understanding. Oh, sorry. Furies only exist to tear down hunters at a moment of triumph. From here, Marlo and Sable would meet up, discover Marlo's hidden powers, team up to defeat the Fury, and they would 
venture on and try to continue and continue finding the theories that exist in the world. All the while discovering the truth of what happened during the last war. But where did this all come from? It had to come from somewhere. The entire story is centered around the hunters, and the only reasons the hunter even hunters even exist is because I changed one character's name. Originally, I ha what is going on? Uh, okay. <laughs> so originally, I had a character named Hunter, but or he a character named Hunter who would have lost someone close to them, and blames himself for that person's death. However, I, it is plugged in. Okay. Um, however, I changed Hunter's name to Seba due to being in, liking a certain character from a video game called Warframe. Anyways, I changed Hunter's name. I didn't want to get rid of Hunter entirely. So I decided to make Hunter a title, a role that Seba would play. Something I also thought of was the Hunters of Artemis. That's one of the first things that I think of when I hear Hunter, because I love Greek mythology. <laughs> uh, from there, I decided that I wanted Seba to have been the leader of these Hunters, to have been called Artemis at one point, and to have assumed a new identity. And ultimately, that reason is because I just made him trans. Um, I also toyed around with the idea that Seba could have betrayed the Hunter and was on the run from them, or that he blamed himself for the Hunters being disbanded. However, I wasn't really sure what to do, and I didn't really like those ideas all that much. That was until I created Wiro. Um, this is the main villain of the story, but anyways, going back to the Hunters of Artemis, I decided that I wanted to name all of the Hunters after gods, but I didn't only want to use gods from Greek mythology. So I decided to do some research. I needed a villain for the story, so I just... I decided, searched up gods of evil and stumbled onto Wiro, who is the Maori incarnation of evil itself. Um, he heavily inspired by The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is also just, that game is the biggest inspiration for the story, I would say. Um, I decided that Wiro would have been trapped away for a long time uh, after having caused a destructive war, which is the last war. Seba believes that he let the last war happen because he could have stopped Wiro before Wiro caused it, but didn't be out of love for who Wiro once was. The idea of the Furies came from an older idea that I had of monsters called Eidolons. What? Uh, sorry. Anyways, Eidolons were originally people warped and malformed by a form of purified magic called Ether. These people then became mindless monsters who only acted on instinct. There would have been a hierarchy of power in the Eidolons, and Furies would have rested on top. Having been extremely powerful people before they warped, I think it's a good time to mention that this is sci-fi fantasy. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, when Wiro entered the picture, I decided that the Furies would have been the original Eidolons created by Wiro himself, who had the power to control purified magic. Originally, I decided that Wiro would have just been evil for the sake of being evil, but I decided that instead, Wiro should have been someone who started off nice, but descends into evil over time due to hatred and jealousy. This led to the current iteration of the Furies. They are a unique curse that Wiro placed on each of the hunters in order to tear them down at a moment of triumph or revelation. This curse would have been the true start of the last war. Is the thing not working? Hmm. That's not working. Sad. Um, but what was the last war? Well, it all starts with why the hunters existed in the first place, uh, something called the Hunter Initiative. The initiative claimed to be about creating a group of elite warriors to stop wars before they happened, but in reality, it was a ploy to, ex to experiment the effects of the ether on people's bodies behind the backs of the entire world. The hunters were subjected to painful, and inhumane experiments, but in return were granted immense power. The hunters either had what magical powers they ha already had enhanced or gained new powers altogether. No matter the case, all the hunters attained power that benefited them and whatever goals they may have had before joining the Hunter Initiative. All except for Wiro. 
he was a prodigious and powerful spellcaster who, sorry, he was a powerful and prodigious spellcaster, but lost the ability to cast spells altogether as a result of the hunter initiative. However, another one of the hunters, Thoth, gained, uh, sorry, became an extremely powerful spellcaster due to the initiative. This led to Wiro being immensely jealous of Thoth. Wiro believed that the world, whole world was complicit in this divine injustice that he believed he was dealt and sought to destroy the whole world in order to start over. The last war ended when Thoth sacrificed his life to seal Wiro away forever. However, Thoth's fury awoke when he accepted his fate. The fury interrupted the spell, causing Thoth to not fully die and Wiro to not be fully sealed away, which leads us back to the beginning of the story. Thoth wakes up Marlo a century after the events of the last war because Thoth's seal is weakening. Wiro will soon be released. Meanwhile, Seba finally gathered enough courage to hunt down the remaining Furies, starting with the one in the city of Shattered Glass, the same city that Marlo awakes in. So what is even the point of all of this? Every single idea that I shared comes from years upon years of thinking about and reworking the story in my head. And the dozens of inspirations that I've had throughout my life have all shaped the way that this story has gone. It has gone through so many iterations. I, like, and so a lot of those iterations could be their own stories because of how different they are. I could go on for hours about every single individual detail. And when he said that, when, when Mr. Paulson said that this is just the tip of the iceberg, it is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more that I haven't talked about because for the sake of time, um, but that's really what writing is about, is taking all those ideas and inspirations that float in your head and putting them to words. Writing is an extremely messy process, and it takes a long time to get your ideas fleshed out. Th this all is just a culmination of specifically this school year, because for no reason in particular, I just decided to start everything over, and that's how I got to this. Um, and I haven't actually s properly started writing the story yet, but I have written one thing that I'd like to share with you all, which is the intro of the story. So, Marlo saw a great flash of white, so bright it nearly hurt her eyes. She felt like she was floating in a blank canvas. Marlo couldn't smell anything, taste anything, or even feel anything. She couldn't even move, but she could feel herself drifting. There was a great ringing in her ears, and all she could see was white. She floated like this for what felt like an eternity. Nothing to do except watch the white and listen to the sound of nothing. Then something began to appear in Marlo's vision, a small speck of golden yellow amidst the endless blank. Marlo didn't know what it was, but it felt warm, radiant. Her arm lifted as if it had a mind of its own and reached out, trying to touch it. The ringing in her ears turned into a crackling and she could hear a muffled, fuzzy something. The golden yellow began to grow and grow and grow until it was about the size of a person, and inside of that golden yellow was a silhouette. Marlo couldn't tell what it was, it was far too blurry. Suddenly, the yellow and black shifted into high fidelity, and the muffled tones in her ear became clear as crystal. The shock jolted her upright and just in time. Gravity began to take hold, and Marlo felt herself standing on nothing. <laughs> in front of Marlo stood a short man with the head of an ibis, wearing a cotton shirt and black pants. He held a tome in one hand and futzed with a collection of strange floating symbols in the other. Blast it all! Is it working now? He looked over at Marlo. Marlo stared at him. Can you hear me? The bird man asked worriedly. Can, can you even speak? Uh, yeah, Marlo managed. I can. She had to force the words out of her mouth. For whatever reason, it took a lot of effort. Good, good, the man said, though he still looked quite anxious. I'm Thoth. Long story short, I'm the one that brought you here. I need your help, Marlo. Is that my name? Marlo asked, tilting her head. Yes, it is, Thoth sighed. I don't have time to explain. It took all the power I had to even find you, much, much less set up this connection. Marlo's vision began to blur. Oh, stars above, Thoth moaned. I'm so sorry, Marlo. There's so much I wish I could tell you. 
Philip's voice began to grow fuzzy, and Marlowe's vision became more and more unfocused. A loud wind began to blow through, and an inky blackness began to tear apart the perfect light. Seek out a man named Saba. He can tell you more, shouted Thoth. Marlowe could barely see him now, and she could barely make out his words through the wind. Watch out for the... But his warning was cut off as the void continued to spread, engulfing everything before swallowing Marlowe whole. When Marlowe opened her eyes, she was already standing up. She was too disoriented to think anything of it. And it was a good thing, too. Glass shards blanketed the ground everywhere she could see. Marlowe wasn't sure where she was. When she looked down, she could see her broken reflection staring back at her a thousand times over. She was underground, that much was apparent. The cavern was dimly lit by a false moon up above, shining with a greenish blue light, and the air was stale and damp. The sky appeared to be made of metal plates. All around Marla were the skeletons of great buildings, each and every one of their windows shattered. And everything was empty. There were no signs of people anywhere. There were benches and bent and upturned lampposts and upturned street benches. Inside the cafes and restaurants, tables and chairs were knocked over and scattered chaotically, the food still fresh, cups of tea and coffee still steaming. Newspapers, bags, eyeglasses, and a myriad of other personal belongings littered the ground. Marlowe found it odd. It seemed as both as though the city had long since been abandoned and that it had been attacked just moments ago. Marlowe didn't dwell in it for long, though. How could she when there was this strange growling coming from behind her? Thank you. So, uh, a few thank yous I have. First and foremost is mom for putting up with me for the last three years. <laughs> um, and always, always, always doing what she could to help me push through high school because it wasn't easy. Um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Paulson for being such an amazing advisor. Um, <laughs> Mr. Paulson constantly would like listen to my ideas, give me ways like, implore me to expand on ideas in ways that were, like, very, it, it just was so helpful, and I really cannot thank you enough, and also for all the help that you did for actually getting me to put this all together. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. And then also to Jill Howe um, for all her help this, these past three years for getting me through school as well. Um, I'd also like to thank every teacher in the high school for being patient with me because I have not been the best student. <laughs> Uh, um, I'd like to thank Ari and Ursula for being amazing friends, and especially to Ursula for like listening to my story a lot early on, and in, at least indirectly helping me reach conclusions, like reach important things and figure things out. And then lastly, to my class, you all of your presentations have been really inspiring. They've made me so excited to do my own, and I'm so excited to see the rest of yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie. Questions? Now, yeah. Jamie, I loved your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I loved your topic, loved your presentation, loved how you talked about some of my favorite stories, some of my favorite books, and I think you did it really well. Um, and I was just thinking of so many questions that I had the whole time, but I wanted to ask you, what's your favorite trope, fantasy trope? And I also wanted to ask, uh, What's your favorite, like, fantasy, mythical creature? Fantasy trope. I have no clue. I don't know any. I can't think of tropes off the top of my head. Um, as her favorite mythical creature, like, fantasy creature, I also don't know. <laughs> I, I like unicorns, I guess. <laughs> uh, Jamie, I have a question. Um, it was a wonderful presentation, very inspirational. I found myself, see, 
I found myself <laughs> thinking about uh, stories that are running around in my head, and I uh, was reminded of something that uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote about writing, which is both process and um, the finished product. He says, like, some of it is like a jigsaw puzzle, and the reason we love jigsaw puzzles, like, you know what it's supposed to end up looking like. You have the box with the finished picture. I think I know the answer to this, which is that the process for you is really engrossing and very interesting to hear about, but what about uh, when you actually complete it, when you put that last piece in and it's done, do you think that you will be as satisfied as you have been in creating it? Oh, yes, I think so, because it would be like, finally done. <laughs> um, I am I'm very excited to write it, but I'm also scared because I know it's going to be a lot of work, but I'm still very excited because I know it's going to be so much fun and just so cathartic to finally get this out of my head. Um, so I have two questions. So first of all, really good um, like presentation. You seemed really enthusiastic about the subject <laughs> and you delivered it really Thank well. You. Um, I was wondering, so first, do you have any advice for people who are starting out reading? And the second is, are any of the characters in the book based off either real people or you? Um, wait, what was the first question? Do you have any advice for people who are either writing or starting out writing? Oh, uh, for starting out writing, just do it. I, it might be cliche advice, but seriously, write, just write stuff down. Even if it's not like an actual draft of the thing, but like write down characters, relationships, um, story outlines, stuff like that. It really does help. And writing drafts as well can really help to solidify things in your head and figure, help you figure out, is this a good idea or is this not a good idea? That's what drafts are for, is filtering out the bad and taking those little nuggets of gold. And what was the second question? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, characters based on people in my l I don't actually think there's any characters based on other people, at least that I, like, intentionally... Um, or me. I don't, I don't really, I'm not really sure, to be honest. I, I just sort of created the characters, and I didn't really explain a lot about them either. I will, I'm not really, I don't think so. Not intentionally. That was really great, and it, it looks like you just literally vibrate with ideas. I and, do. Um, I literally vibrate. I'm vibrating yeah, right now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> And I was wondering if you could share with us some of how, some of the things that inspire you to begin. Like, um, you know, you mentioned, like, do you ever start out with a sentence or something um, or like a character or so how do you do that? The way that all of this current iteration started was actually with just one character. Uh, pretty much everything that I've talked about is just in my head. I've written some stuff down, but a lot of this is just in my head. I'm not entirely, sh I, I kind of forgot your question, I'm sorry. I have, <laughs> oh, I start out with a sentence. I don't, It's. it usually has to do when I suddenly think of something is how I expand everything. The, mo the, like the key parts in figuring everything out for my story as it is right now first was changing Hunter's name to Seba and keep turning Hunter into a uh, role. And then also the creation of Wiro, the main antagonist, because I feel like you can't have a story without an antagonist in a, in a way. Well, you can, but like this kind of story can't exist without a villain. So, yeah. Great it job. Um, I really like the beginning of your story. Um, Thank you. <laughs> are you planning to copy and sell your Sorry. It, what? <laughs> are you planning to copy and sell your book? Uh, at some point, probably. Uh, at some point, yes, actually. Um, but I'll have to decide whether or not to turn it into a uh, graphic novel or not. Like, gra no, anyways. Do you have a favorite like book or author? Uh, favorite author, Rick Riordan. Uh, I haven't, he's like the only author that I've actually obsessively reread books for. I obsessively reread The Heroes of Olympus in middle school. He is my biggest like writing inspiration. 
Um, yeah, specifically for like biggest inspiration for author. Uh, um. So I, I'm assuming when you think of these ideas, it's in your brain, and it's like more of like a mental image or event. How do you transfer that to writing? I, <laughs> I haven't started that yet. <laughs> um, were you inspired by Dungeons and Dragons at all? Because it seemed very Dungeons yes, and actually. Dragons. Yes, actually. Um, the very original inspiration that I had, I, I believe... Like the, the thing that s sort of started everything was actually a Dungeons and Dragons character. Yay! <laughs> Good job. No, I love Dungeons and Dragons. I Do we have time for one more? Ah. Uh, They've asked enough questions. Uh, um, I know that J.K. Rowling apparently had the whole story in her head before she actually wrote it down. And then I've read of other authors who kind of start the story and the characters kind of lead them along in certain directions. And I'm wondering, do you have the whole thread in your head or are you kind of letting it unfold as it goes along? It's like somewhere in between, because I don't have this very specific like stuff that's going to, happen, but I have, I, it, like, on the pin board outside, I have, like, all the major events that happen in the story, like, um, the last war was something that I sort of planned out more or less, uh, the, and then there's, like, the City of Shattered Glass, which is the most planned out, Tomb of the Lawns, Heaven's Throne, all of that, those are, it, I, those are, like, all the major story beats, and I have all, a lot of the major story beats, but not the specific stuff that happens in them. So if I would you say I'm in between. have the opportunity to have Jamie um, narrate you through the board that they've created in the gallery out there, I, I, I highly recommend it. It's a good time. <laughs> Thank you. All right, one more round of applause for Jamie. <laughs> have our lunch break now. For those of you that are going to be at the last presentation, please come back at uh, 12.55. High school, be back in your seats at 12.55. Don't make me come looking for you.
I haven't spent much time up here this week. I might stretch this out a little bit. I'm just kidding. Um, let me tell you what is so enjoyable about teaching Akemi Duarte. So I've had Akemi now for three and a half years. Whenever she runs into something that's not quite fitting together in her understanding, she focuses on it like a white hot knot of light and she'll stand there and she'll ask questions and then when she, when she has that light bulb moment you literally see her light up you see her smile you see her eyes get bigger and then the next great thing that happens is she takes all that copious imagination and creativity of hers and she starts infusing her understanding of that new thing with all of that so when she came to me and said, I want to start my own business for her senior project, I saw that that was happening for her on a megawatt level. I had never seen her so excited about anything. So I said, well, of course, that's a great thing for you to do. And the more she explained how she was going to start her own business and it was going to be a storefront and all this, I said, you do understand you have to finish 12th grade, right? You're not. But yeah, she's been on a journey. She did a lot of work on the fundamentals of starting a business, but today in her presentation, she's going to be more focusing on the journey for her into her enthusiasm for what, she's, what she wants to sell, what she wants to bring to the world around her, and so it's a pretty exciting story. So everybody, Akemi Duarte. My name is Akemi Duarte, and today we're going to be talking about, oh no, okay, about Protein Paradise. So before we talk about Protein Paradise, actually, I want to let you guys know that I did come up with the logo, Protein Paradise, along with the logo with the help of Ms. Hoffman. Um, couldn't, doubt, couldn't have done it without you. Um, also, this is not only a senior project, but a lifelong project, and I'm so excited to share this with you guys. Oh, my bad. Okay, to start off with, let's talk about some table of contents. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is Protein Paradise? So what is the goal, what is sold, et cetera? Two, what do I want in the business and why do I want the business? There's always a why to something and this is my why. Three, the 10 steps. So these are the logistics of starting a small business. Four, my 10 steps. So how are my 10 steps different than the regular steps? Five, what's in Protein Paradise? So it's Herbalife, her certifications, criticism, et cetera. Six, the generation switch. Seven, the drinks. That's enough of that. Eight, training with the best. Scientists, business owners that I got to meet with, etc. Nine, what has been done so far? So what I have been doing so far to start this Protein Paradise community? Okay, first is, what's in, what is Protein Paradise? Protein Paradise is a future storefront that I would love to create, providing delicious beverages such as protein shakes, refreshers, cheesecakes, along with other healthy pastries. Um, and outside on my display is a little vision that I have of how I want the store to look like. And yeah, hopefully it comes true. Um, not only that, but I want to help people feel welcomed, offering delicious shakes. So when they come into my store, they're like feeling good, feeling energetic and feeling healthy. Number two, my why and what? Like I said before, there's a way to, there's always a why to something and this is my why. So ever since I was little, I drank the products. As you may or may not know, my parents also have the business. Um, yeah, so I always grew up around successful people, very learning from them, seeing how they talk, how they move, how they run their business. Um, also, as I was little, I was eating the products. Here's me eating a lemon citrus bar. It's protein, so that's where I get all my muscles. <laughs> um, and then here behind the bar is me as a baby making shakes. So as I grew up, I grew up in the business, but I also made um, protein shakes, and I always taught my friends how to make protein shakes, so it was really fun. Um, also right here is Enrique and, no, Garen Jones and Enrique, they're also very successful in the business. Um, and yeah, I just love, 
I loved everything and the opportunity they gave my parents to spend time with me and to go on vacations, and it was really fun. Now, what do I want in the business? What I want in the business, and I want to attract people, healthy people, and the community gives me the fitness atmosphere that it has. Also, what I, want, what I like about it is that I grow up with uh, like such positive people, amazing people, open-minded people, and I just love the atmosphere. Also, the lifestyle it gives you is crazy, and I love it. Number three, the 10 steps. Okay, I literally went online and I was like, how do you start a small business? And I literally went and this is what I got. Um, <laughs> so the first thing I got was to create my own and turn it to action. Okay, for me that would be create a healthy coffee shop, in other words. Second, write my business plan. Okay, for me that would be what to sell, create a system around that. Third, fund my, br fund my business. Okay, that would be create a budget. Five, pick up the business location. For me, that would be around the Andersonville location or on the Foster, Foster Streets or around universities, high schools, or gyms. And later on, I would explain why. And six, choose my business name. Check. Flipping Paradise. Seven, register my business. Okay, that would be register my business with the federal government. Then federal, state, and tax IDs. So this is like an employee identification. In other words, this is a social security number for your business. Apply for permits and license. Okay, I would go to the city hall. Yes, it will cost a little bit of, a little bit of money, but it's okay, it's worth the investment. And last, once all of those boxes have been checked, I can then open a business banking account. How does this benefit me? This benefits me because it shows the IRS that the business isn't just a hobby, and it, it has tax preparation easier, and it establishes business credit, so I can invest more money on the products and while still earning. Okay, my 10 steps. Before I get into my 10 steps, yes, I will 100% be taking the steps that I just spoke about in full consideration because I need, I need a guide to how to start the business, and yeah. So what a lot of business owners don't talk about is the mindset. I believe that without a successful business, without a successful mindset, you can have a successful, successful business. So these are what I think. And this is what I also learned while being in the business and, sorry, this is what I learned by having my senior project and researching and yeah. So the first thing is passion. I need to have passion. I need to have a drive for something. I need to want to want it. If something goes bad, I need, to, I need to say, hey, like, okay, how can we make this work? Second, discipline. I need to have discipline. I need to be able to wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning, go to sleep by 10 p.m. and just ready for the next day. Then I need to take initiative. If I have my protein place and stuff, I'm not gonna say, if something wasn't done by someone else, I'm not gonna like wait for someone to say, hey, Kim, you need to do this. No, I need to take full action and say, hey, okay, I'm gonna do this without someone being able to tell me. Fourth, time management. I need to be able to manage my time. Okay, I have this meeting, I have this gym, I have this thing going on this night. Okay, I need to know how to manage that time and manage it in, and manage it in my schedule as well. Fifth. Leadership. I need to take leadership in something, be mature in, in, um, in a group and say, hey, okay, how can we make this work? Patience. I need to have patience. This, this, does, this applies for progress, employees. And by I me, mean by progress, it's 1% every day. Okay? As long as I'm getting better each day and every day, I will get better. But it's all about patience. Also, patience with employees. If someone says, hey, like, I didn't like my drink. What the hell? I'm going to be like, like, I have to take deep breaths and be like, whew. Okay, how can we fix it? And same thing goes with communication. I need to be able to communicate with my employees. If my employees say, if they didn't do the drink right that the lady was yelling about, like such and such, I'd be like, hey, like, what's, what's going on? How did the drink come out bad? What can we do for next time? And then eighth, energy. I cannot stress this enough. You need to have, I need to have energy. I can't go in somewhere and be like, hey guys, like, yeah, you do that task, I do that, whatever. You do that task stuff like that, um, I need to have energy. I can't, people aren't gonna wanna be around me if I have no energy, okay? I can't be a boring person. <laughs> All right, and last two, emotional intelligence and believe that I am capable of doing it. By emotional intelligence, I mean that it's my capacity to be aware of and control my express, and control and express my emotions. It enables me as a leader to handle interpersonal relationships. And lastly, as corny as it sounds, I have to believe that I'm capable of doing it. Yes, my parents can believe I can do it. Yes, my friends can believe I can do it. But I have to believe that I can do it. Okay, now that I've said that, what's in Protein Paradise? So last time, 
actually recently, I went to Jamba Juice and I saw that it had soy protein in it and I was like, okay, yeah, like I'll try the soy protein. It was good, but like it was, it was terrible. And I also went to Smoothie King. I also went to Smoothie King and they were like putting all these protein powders. I mean, yeah, the drink was good, but like I was putting in the protein powders, but like you never really know what are those protein powders. Like how are those beneficial to me? Yes, they can tell the calories and stuff, but you don't know. I don't know if this happened to you guys. You go to Starbucks and they put like such and such syrup in it. You don't know what that is. You know, I mean, as long as the drink tastes good, right? But I'm going to be telling you what is in protein powders and how is that benefiting you while you drink it. Before I get into that, actually, I want to touch on two main things. First is Herbalife. So you may or may not know, Herbalife is involved with Protein Paradise and the products are in it. Um, so let me give you a formal ver verified definition of what it is. Herbalife is a global nutrition company offering a range of science-based nutrition products that include weight management, nutritional supplements, personal care products that are, that are intended to support a healthy and active lifestyle. Now, I've been drinking it since I was a baby, actually in the womb, um, and I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. It's so good, it's so healthy, and it's very high quality. Okay, getting on to what are Herbalife certifications. So Herbalife is certified in many things, especially NSF. Um, NSF also means that it's certified for sports, so it's really good. So the first thing it's certified here, as we can say, low GI. Low GI means that it's low in glycemic index. What does that mean? It, it means that it helps prevent a spike in blood glucose and levels and addressing pain in the pancreas area. So this is particularly for individuals with diabetes. Second, GF. GF signifies that the product is gluten-free. So this means that it's eliminating gluten from its composition. What does CDC mean? Now, next, CDC. CDC means that Herbalife can be trusted in, in wellness and health. It is further enhanced by its C because it's CDC approved. CDC stands for Certified Diabetes Prevention Program. And lastly, the heart with the check. The heart sign with the check inside means that the product contains at least 25 grams of protein. And unlike the Jamba Juice protein, soy protein, it's actually good. Um, it contributes to a low diet and saturated, saturated fat and cholesterol fat. This reduces the risk of heart disease and each formula one of the protein powder serves at least one gram of soy protein. Okay. Now that all those boxes are checked, let's get into what Herbalife products are in Protein Paradise. Like, like the drink uh, right there. Oh, I forgot that part. Okay, so I decided to choose the three main ones, refreshers, protein shakes, and acai bowls. So these are the three main ones that are very popular. The refreshers, as you can see right here, have Liftoff. Liftoff is um, actually, is part of the 24 line. I actually have that every day before I go to the gym. Um, the Liftoff has panage ginseng, caffeine, grana extract, and anositol. How does this help you? This helps you support hydration, kickstart metabolism, promote alertness. It also has vitamin C, B1 through 7, and B12. But the crazy thing is it has no sugars, no artificial flavoring, or sweeteners, and it's only 15 calories. Unlike Red Bull, a lot of sugars, a lot of calories, or other ones. Next is aloe. So this is made with plant-based ingredients, contains natural enzymes, vitamins, minerals, and amino acids. These ingredients help improve your digestive system, along with the tea. The tea is formulated with traditional orange pico and tea, black tea blend. These, these uh, blends help protect heart, reduce blood pressure, and lower your, blood, lower your blood sugar. It also has green tea and cardamom seed extracts and hibiscus flower powder. This helps your, lower your cholesterol, enhance memory, and balance your blood sugar. And all of these things combined help improve your immune system. So it's also, it also regulates your digestive system and helps remove toxins from the liver. I think it's pretty cool. It cleanses your body very well and flushes everything out. Okay, protein shake. So they both have acai bowls and, oh, actually the refreshers also have a flavoring. So if you want like a pineapple refresher, we'll put in the flavoring. The flavoring only has 10 calories and one gram of sugar. So the protein shakes is Formula One. The Formula One contains pea, quinoa, rice powder, and helps with the reduced calorie diet along with a moderate, moderate exercise. So it's, in other words, it's a meal replacement shake. Um, my favorite actually is a chocolate and mint chocolate chip. All you have to do is put the protein shake in, ice, water, blend it up, splits, it's really yummy. And then it also has the PDM. The PDM contains B vitamins along with B12. It has copper to support your metabolism and it has magnesium to support 
your cells from oxidative stress. What is oxidative stress? It's what causes wrinkles and makes you more old, faster. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what prevents it. And the crazy thing that I found about it is that it's 20 minerals that help you reach your recommended daily intake. What other protein powder does that? All right, then the acai bowls. The only difference is that frozen fruits are added into it. So, yeah. For my favorite part, number six, the generation switch. So this is a reason why I did this in the whole place, in the whole, yeah. Um, so at first, I actually wanted to do criminology or forensic science. I thought it was pretty cool. Like, yeah, murder, let me solve that. So <laughs> the generation switch. Uh, so my parents, you know, like I said before, they did the business. So I was like, okay, yeah, I, you know, like, I kind of don't want to do that. Why would I follow your footsteps? Like, that's not, that's not really fun. So, because it was boring to me. Back then, it was just like a bunch of old people coming in. And the drinks looked like this. They looked like this. That's pretty boring. Like, who would want to drink that, right? <laughs> but, like, believe it or not, they were actually really yummy. They were really, they're just not attractive. So that's what they sold before. And the clubs look like this. Some still look like this. But, you know, I don't, I don't know. Personally, I wouldn't want to walk in there. So... <laughs> And now, until the whole switch happens. Now, the refresher drinks and the teas are now looking like Dunkin' drinks, but only healthier. The protein shakes are looking like milkshakes, but protein shakes. And now there's waffle, protein waffles, protein. Herbalife also came out with baked goods, which you can make like pizza dough, you can make donuts out of it, and the acai bowls. So now that's more attracting and more appealing to the customer. Not only that, but the places now look like this. Pretty cool, right? Like, I, now I want to go in. So I got the opportunity to go to Texas and California. And over here, oh, this one. Um, right here, this one is in Texas. His name is Paolo. Paolo has an amazing influence of young people. He goes, <clears throat> he makes the drinks, a little bit different than I do. And he goes to high schools and gives it to the football team, the volleyball team, the gymnastic teams. And guess what? They all love it. So they're like, <clears throat> yes, I want more. Um, and that's how he gets such a great following of teens. <clears throat> and then over here is another lady. She actually has already a career. She's an architect, as you can tell by, like, this amazing stuff. She's an architect, but she also wanted to do this business part-time. So she decided to do it. And then also over here is Miriam. I will be talking to about her in a bit. She's only 24 years old, um, and it's pretty cool. Okay. Number seven, now the drinks. So, I, I thought this was fun. I wanted over the, while researching about my senior project, I had my friends try out the product before going to the gym. And they tried it out also for the volleyball team, the girls' volleyball team. They also tried it, and they, like, I, I let them see how they felt throughout the workout and see if they liked it or not. And I guess you can also, another thing before I play it, my sticker was still being designed. So you might see like two other stickers in it. So yeah, also some people were also trying the protein coffee. But before I actually start the video, who here has already tried the refreshers? Okay, that's a lot of people. <laughs> so you, you may or may not be in the video, who knows? <laughs> Refresher. 10, it was 11 out of 10. Yeah. How did you feel during the debut game? 10 out of 10, a lot of energy. 10 out of 10, amazing. Sweet but not too sweet. It didn't have that protein texture. It was just really, it's really good. It's 10. Uh, I completely inhaled it all in 10 minutes. And it was very good. Not that like grainy protein, you know. It was, it was great. And it tasted like coffee. Oh, and plus, Red Bull is super sugary. Yeah. Oh, it's 10 calories per can. That's, awesome. That's crazy. Yeah, I got We're trying out Timmy's Fortune Paradise drink. 10 out of 10. I just like pump it in. Ten out of ten, let's try again. Carlos, how was the energy drink? Right? Yeah, he liked it. Your good comments about it. Protein Paradise, recommended by Dane. Come guys. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> 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 
So I hope some of you want to try them now. There will be some samples out there, so for comfort serve. Um, okay, yeah, they're excited. Um, so number eight, training with the best. So I got the opportunity to talk to some scientists that already do the business, or no, that work on the products, and I get to learn what I'm giving people and how is that good for you. So over here is Jason Wick. He is a chairman, and he is, oh my god, I learned so much about him. He learned, he taught, he taught us how to work finances, how to attract people in your business, and so did Miriam. I also spoke with Miriam. Miriam is so fit, she's so nice, she's so successful, and only 24 years old, and it's crazy. Um, yeah, and she has an amazing following of young people as well. And so it's his sister, her sister is Alejandra Reese. She's only 21 years old, and they're both my, like, idols because they're so pretty and... Oh, amazing. And also they're just like, oh my goodness, okay. And then I also got the opportunity to talk with Jesse Diaz. Jesse Diaz, I hope she, he's watching. Um, Jesse Diaz is an incredible person, great person, fun. And I went to his place. He's located in Chicago. And I went in and I asked for an acai bowl. And he was, he was like, okay, yeah, I got you. And I was like, okay, all right. And he was making me acai bowls, and he was, like, talking with his employees. He was like, yeah, like, how was your day today? Like, you know, like, okay. Oh, good. Are you going to the gym later? Oh, you have a party? Oh, okay, cool. Like, they were not at all, like, stressed or, like, they were just making my acai bowls in full, like, fun. And I tried it, and I was like, okay, I taste the fun. And I was like, okay, like, this is good. But what I admired about him was that, after trying the acai bowl, or after, yeah, after watching him do the acai bowl, he went out and he spoke with me and he was more sure about it. He was professional. So what I admired about him is that he knew when to switch up. He knew, okay, this is my moment to be fun, but this is also my moment to be professional. And I got, I spoke with Jesse. I couldn't add in the voice memo, but Jesse said, hello, my name is Jesse Diaz. I asked, Jesse, why did you start the business? Jesse said, I started the business and I became really passionate with the products. And then I saw how much it improved my life. And then I knew it would become, in the business sense, more customers were going to be looking for this type of resources. I knew it would be a value to the marketplace. Nine, what has been done so far? So, uh, maybe you may or may not seen outside, there is hoodies and the stickers have already been done. That took me some time, but that's what's been done. And the merchandise, we've created some hoodies. They have the logo on top and then they have, um, <laughs> they have the logo on the left side and they have a dumbbell on the back and it says motivated, com consistent, determined. So those are pretty comfy. So you can sign up for one out there in my display. Um, also, we are looking forward to making more t-shirts, maybe beanies for the winter. We'll see. And then, oh, sorry. And then for social media, I've created an Instagram account. And this account, I've posted all those videos that I've done. Also, people trying the products and stuff. Um, also, for the future, I'm hoping to make, like, a YouTube channel, maybe, and, like, like journal entry, how the business is going, how the actual location is going. Um, maybe talk about, like, the plumbing issues and stuff like that. It's fun. Um, and then... Third is business courses. I had the opportunity as well to take some business courses during the summer about finance, how to attract more people, how to manage your money and stuff. So that's very exciting for me. And lastly, internships. I am so excited for internships because I get to work with another young person. She also has an amazing following of young people, this whole Gen Z. And I'm excited to just work with her and see how she manages it. And yeah. And before I be done, I just want to say, um, that this is literally just the beginning. Thank you.
my thank yous are to everyone. Thank you for listening, for being here. Uh, I really thank that a lot and for supporting me overall and for wearing the stickers. Yay. Um, I want to thank Mr. McCarthy. Thank you for being a great personal advisory. Um, you're really funny. Yeah. Um, Ms. Von Orthel, thank you so much for helping me design the hoodie and for borrowing me your laptop. Um, Ms. Hoffman, thank you for helping me create the stickers. That was really fun. Um, I want to thank my class. You guys are doing amazing. All of you have done so great, and I'm so excited for what you guys have to bring. Um, although we've been through ups and downs during the year, but it's okay. We've come together. <laughs> we've come together, and I'm so happy that we're just, you know, <laughs> bringing you back together. Um, and then I want to thank my eighth grade class. You guys are amazing. I love that you guys welcome me with open hands. And to Mr. Jono, you're so sweet and kind. Thank you. And to our lovely Jordan Gutierrez. I love her so much. She's taught me so much. Um, yeah. I also want to thank Elise and Nora. Thank you guys so much for, for everything. Um, Eva and Alma, I know you're listening. Thank you. And Brianna for being my best friend. Thank you so much. Um, I thank Joey. Thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> Um, yet, Neil, thank you for giving me fashion advice. And, uh, <laughs> and then, Haiti, thank you. I love you. Um, and my parents, thank you so much for bringing me to the school, even though I didn't want to come. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for everything. Los amo mucho. And thank you to all. <laughs> Start back here with Kate. Hello. Hi. Um, I think that um, it's really good. I think it's really, really, really overall really good. Um, I got a question. So, um, so are all of the um, refreshers and bowls and all of that, like, just all... Like, can they be all non-dairy as well? Yes, or they actually don't have any milk in them, so, or any dairy at all, or in, in general, yeah. Okay, um, and I got one more question. What's your, what's your other um, question? What, um, what challenges have you gone through? Have you gotten through, like, s like, some challenges where you can't, like, some people might reject or something like that? Like, or, yeah. Um, so, like, other mm -hmm. challenges that you faced through along your journey where other people might say that it's bad or anything, that it should be more improved? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, yes, I've actually, the, yeah, those are challenges where people are going to say no and rejection is gonna come your way, but you just got you just have to move on and say, okay, well, it's your loss, you know. Um, but yeah, um, what was the other thing? Just no and say no. Yeah. Kimmy, what is a protein? What is protein? <laughs> it's a molecule of amino acids together, gathered together. Now it makes protein. What's an amino acid? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. Somebody over there. Great job, Akemi. Uh, how? Uh, Sorry. Oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, see it. How can I uh, invest in this uh, shop or in this company? <laughs> um, you can honestly, we can talk. And like, <laughs> you know, and if you invest, you can probably make another one of your own and then you get money off of that or money off of me and then you get 10% and I get the rest. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I go up to be a teenager, is it okay? Can I join your group, your business? <laughs> yes, of course. Please. <laughs> I'm 
so cute. Oh my god, Laszlo. Hi. Hi, Laszlo. Um, so great job. If Thank I you. become a YouTuber, can I sponsor you? What happened? <laughs> can I sponsor you if you if I become a YouTuber? Sponsor me if I become a YouTuber? Oh yeah. Same thing. I don't know. I don't know how this stuff works. Also, what is Formula One like thingy mabob? Like your Formula One drink thing. It's oh it's protein. Okay. He's answered his own question. <laughs> so, can you hand me up? Do you like sell these drinks? Like, at a school? like how much are they? Do you like sell them at a school? So regularly they're ten dollars. Okay. But since you guys are all Waldorf students, I give you seven. So because okay. discount. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Akemi. You did Hi, such Akemi. an amazing job. It was so, so like inspirational. Thank so you so much. I That's wanted my to goal. know, like, how are you, like, if you open up a business in college, how are you gonna balance college life and business life? It's a real question. Together. Actually, I'm gonna take a gap year and focus full on, like, locked in the business, and then see where it takes me. Good job. <laughs> I'm over here. Okay. So great job, by the way. Thank you. I saw your progress. Thank you. Really good. Thanks. Uh, are you ready for the challenges you're gonna meet in the future? Like, um, that's a good question. I think I just have to prepare mentally, and like, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. First of all. Buy Protein Paradise, it's so <laughs> yummy. <laughs> I hate healthy things. This is really good. Uh, I wanted to ask you, okay, so when you become like really rich and successful and you're doing really well, Thanks. let's say someone offers you like a ton of money, right, to your company. Like they offer you the valuation of your company and you have the, uh, offer like you could sell it to someone would you do that for a ton of money for a ton of money where's that money it's good amount. okay well <laughs> it would be like it's just a ton of money okay so that your your business is doing really well and it's worth 20 million dollars and someone offers to sell it <laughs> like to buy it for 20 million dollars holy i don't know i mean depending on where the business is at we'll see but i also just Sometimes it's not just for the money, it's for the fact that people come in and you're just like, it's just a great environment. People come in, you know, consume the products, you're around, surround a bunch of cool fitness people, influencers, so, yeah. Liam? Where did you get the name Protein Paradise from? Uh, from my head. Just kidding. I, I gathered a bunch of friends and I was like, hey, what do you think of this name? What do you think of that name? And then we finally decided Protein Paradise. So, yeah, that was fun. Um, first of all, you. Oh, hi. Hello. Uh, first of all, you look like a real businesswoman. So yeah. you look great. <laughs> you look great. <laughs> Um, could you just explain a little bit about the relationship to Herbalife? Like, do you buy just products from them? Do they give you seed money? Just a little bit more on how the relationship works. So the relationship is, <coughs> yes, Herbalife is their own products, and they have their own, like, formulas and protein shakes and stuff. What we do is, for example, if I want to make, like, a waffle, a waffle, protein waffle, the Herbalife PDM, which is what I spoke about, is I put it in, or actually, let me rephrase. If I wanna make a crepe, let's say if I wanna make a crepe, I only add in two scoops of PDM, two egg whites, and stir that up, put it on the crepe thingy, and then bam, that's how you relate to it, and then make the yummy crepe. Obviously, if you want, depending on where your calories at, you can do less strawberries, more bananas, less chocolate, whatever it is, but that's how our relations, and yeah. Also, you can buy the PDM itself, on its own, or yeah. Where can I try some? Ooh, ooh good question. Um, so obviously the business isn't open yet, 
But if you want, I follow Protein Paradise, and we can post the menu there, and then you just come to me, say, hey, Kemi, I want this tomorrow in the morning, and I'll bring it to you. Yes, special delivery just for you. Very, um, very good job. It's very well presented. Thank you. Very admirable. Um, what would you say was, like, because you're obviously still in school, mm -hmm. you know, 12th grade, how did you find yourself managing, like, doing school and doing this? Because your business is very successful up till now, but you're also a student in school. How would you say that you, like, how did you balance it? Um, it's hard to balance it just because, like, you know, the bit, it's either the business or school, because business is, like, full on. Um, so at first I was really off. I wasn't fully, like, going into the business. I was like, yeah, that's a thing. But now that, you know, senior projects are done, everything's done for the seniors, now I can focus more on it and say, hey, you know, like, I can do this and that. But it was really hard to balance, if that's what your question was, yeah. Uh, what mic do you have? Oh, Carson. Uh, how many orders can you order at once? Like, <laughs> how much can I order? <laughs> Why do you want to order the whole menu? <laughs> I mean, I have a family of seven. <laughs> if I'm ordering, I can't just order one thing if I'm get going somewhere. Oh, you want to get all of it? Okay. Um, you can order as many as you want. I just, okay. I don't know if I can carry it all. So. How about you guys? Okay. So you did so good. Oops. Oh. <laughs> You're doing really good. But I was wondering, once you started your business, are you planning on doing a uh, grand, open grand opening? Yes. So once the business is done and like the store, I put in all the furniture, put in all the stuff. Once that's done. Um, there is a sign-up sheet, and that my goal is for about a year. Get it a year done with, and there's a sheet out there for you to sign up and say, okay, I want to attend the grand opening. So if the grand opening is going to happen, you guys can all get an email and say, and attend it, and probably give free drinks that day. So, yeah. Girl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're back. Okay. First, you did such a good job. And then I would like to join Naya on the fight that your drinks are buzzing. It's so good, guys. <laughs> Just go and get it. I'm not even kidding. You're not going to regret it. Um, and then my question, I would like to know if in the future, of course, you would like to expand your business to international. Because back in France, I think I'm going to miss so much your drink. Mm -hmm. So you should consider coming friends. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the plan to make it international. Let's start off in Chicago. <laughs> number one, great job. Um, Thank you. Number two, I wish you all the luck with your business. Thank you so much. And um, number three, um, do you have any like tips for like starting like actually like like how to like start like a, almost like a foundation? How to start like the foundation of a business? Yeah. Um, well, first, obviously, you need to have a vision. Like, okay, this is what I want. And then just, what have I done? Um, just start getting it out there, you know, and then slowly it'll start coming to you, the, the sales and stuff. But first, get what you want to sell. Get, I'm blinking, but yeah. Just, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, when you were balancing between the protein paradise and school, um, like when it was just a thing, how did you feel about that thing? Like, were you, uh, like, how did you feel about it just being a thing? Like, what do you, like? Like, um. It was just a thing. Like, what did, <laughs> What did you feel about that thing? Like, did you, did you want it to, I know you wanted it to be more, but when you wanted it to, when it was a thing. <laughs> like, you, when it was just a product and no one knew about it, how did I feel about it? Is that your question? No. Oh, uh, okay. Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is a question. Okay, that's a question. Um, I felt like, I don't know, I, at first I was like, is this going to sell? Are people going to like it? I don't know. I'm not sure. But also, if I sell it to the right people, then that can ha get me started and they can pass it on. 
right, by right people, I mean fitness people, because you know, because they like it. And so, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, what, what was your favorite part about starting this business? Mm, I would say the people that like loved it and the community created. I love that a lot. <laughs> Do you have a favorite protein drink? Like protein shake or yeah, shake. protein? Well, I, I, yeah, the the chocolate, mint, mint chocolate and chocolate, blend that up or just shake it up. It's pretty yummy. I have it every morning. It's really yummy. We got one more over here and one over there. George has a question. I'm scared. Okay. Hello. Lazo again. Okay. Since you're my buddy, can I get a free drink? <laughs> you can have the sample drinks. He's working every angle. Go ahead. Um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I was just going to ask, what do you think makes your business apart from all the rest of the protein and like amino acid businesses? What makes my protein business like different? What was it? George? Yeah, like from others? That it's very low in sugar. It has it has it's plant based, and unlike other ones, they also have too much protein in it, and then protein sometimes can become fats. So you need the right. Joseph, a uh, quick question: What yeah. does tea sunrise mean? It's just a name, just tea sunrise, like a tea sunrise, like. What? What's the flavor in it? She wants to know. I think it's is it, it's fruit fruit punch. I think the flavor. I don't know what you're asking. Go ahead. <laughs> Last question. I don't know what you're asking. Um, Akemi, good job. My question is, do you think one day uh, your company will become like a food chain or some type of chain? Uh, yes. Yes, I do think so. With hard work and determination. All right. Thank you. High school, let's let the middle school and the grade school exit first. All right, high school dismissed. See you tomorrow.